Hi, everybody. Parents B. Eichler, thinking outside the locks. A number of years ago, when I moved to Lakewood, New Jersey, I was going to a particular event, and I had just finished davening, and I took my talus and fillin and left them in my car, which I normally don't do. But I was in a bit of a hurry, so I just left them there. When I came back, I saw that the car had been broken into, vandalized, and the talus bag and the tefillin were taken. Now, it didn't have my name on it, but it was clearly identifiable as a talus and tefillin in the blue and black velvet bag. I called the police right away, and they said, hey, we don't think you're going to find this. Probably some guy on drugs figured it was a religious article, and he'll get money for it on the black market. I wouldn't count on seeing them again. Well, I started thinking to myself, it wasn't just the monetary loss, but really there was a tremendous sentimental value to these tefillin. And as I walked downtown, I stopped into a store and mentioned that people should lock their cars because my, my tefillin had been stolen. I didn't realize it, but there were two young teenagers who were standing by, and they overheard the conversation. And um, that night, they came over to me at a wedding and said, we think we found your tefillin. And they told me what happened. Now, before I tell you what happened, let me tell you how I reflected back to how I actually got those tefillin. I was brought up in a community in Queens, New York. Small community, and at that point, I can, sell, I can tell you, and I'm not very proud of it, but I think it's something we can all gain from. Um, let's just say I wasn't where I'm holding today, religiously. The Reform rabbi who bar mitzvahed us kind of didn't want us to put on tefillin. He said, they're vestiges of the past. But if you want, because your grandfather gave them to you, I'll, I'll teach you how to put them on. Of course, he had no recognition or acknowledgement that they were not vestiges of the past, but they were links to the past and are present and are a guarantee for the future. But being only 13 years old, we didn't think too much of it. Didn't think too much of the rabbi at that point who would say something like that as well. But um, we bought the tefillin, put them on, and then put them in our drawer where they laid and laid and laid. Until a number of years later, when I had finished college and decided that I wanted to go to Eretz Israel, and I was going to come to Israel, I wanted to become part of the motion picture and broadcast industry, which I had been trained for. And um, I had trained, not only that, but I had trained myself to be able to be in physical shape so that if I wanted to, I'd be able to go into the Israeli army as a paratrooper. Right! You never know it by looking at me now, but at that time, you know, my late 20s, I was a pretty tough kid. And the karate instructor I had was very tough. He used to train the top black belts in that part of New York, which were in the roughest parts of New York. And one day we were sparring, and I was in full body armor, and he knocked me across the dojo. I went flat on my back. He said, get up, get up, you're going to Israel, you gotta learn to be tough. You gotta learn to defend your people. I said, I can't get up. He says, you gotta get up. Get up when you think you can't get up. Now why am I telling you that? Little did I know that it wasn't gonna be a physical confrontation, but a spiritual and emotional one where those words would come into play. Well, when I got to Eretz Israel, I was, of course, enamored of everything in the country and was looking forward to plying my trade. And I got hired as an actor in an English language theater company. Well, that was pretty amazing because before you knew it, I was starring in an American play in the Israeli equivalent of Broadway for English-speaking audiences. The problem was that we rehearsed in one place and performed in another, which is not typical. Normally, you rehearse and you perform in the same theater, but we didn't. So I'm on my way to the theater in Tel Aviv, and I couldn't find it. The first person I asked as a young Hasidic man dressed from head to toe in the black Hasidic garb, and I said, oh, this guy's going to know how to get to the theater like I could tell you how to get to Jupiter, third star in the right door. <laughs> At any rate. I, I started asking him whatever Hebrew I knew. Uh, you mean the theater? I speak English. I come from Chicago. You must mean the Nachmani Theater. Yes, it's right around the block from my yeshiva. And he took me by the hand and escorted me there. He said, maybe when you finish the course of the play, you'll come and visit us for a, for a Shabbos. I said, well, I really don't know about that. I'll have to think about that. He said, 
here's my name. Come by, we're right around the block. Well, two months after we had finished the play, I had an agent who was ready to go into the Israeli film and motion picture and broadcast industry, and I was just waiting to have my agent get me the next job. I decided, you know what? It was late in the afternoon, late on Shabbos, and I was walking in that area, and I decided to stop in. After all, why shouldn't I keep my word? And then I walked in, and it was the old bell shoe. And I remember thinking, this is amazing. It looks like something right out of Galicia in another century. And I knew one thing. I had to get out of there as fast as I could. But before I could even make a move, he came up to me. He said, hi, I'm so glad you decided to come by. I'd like to introduce you to a few people. And they were very easygoing. No pressure, no this, no that. He said, come sit down, have something to eat. And then this elderly fellow who is sitting with says to me, you know, America is a rechtecher Beit Cholim for Mishagoyim. It's a mental hospital. I said, well, what are you talking about? You've never been there. He says, don't worry. I've seen plenty of the patients. The boys with the earrings and the things like that, they got their, their father's looks and their mother's jewelry. So I said, but you were never in America. He says, don't worry. I've seen plenty of the patients. So I said to him, look, I really appreciate what you did for me, what your student did in taking me to the theater, but um, I really have to go. In any case, instead of just leaving, I thought, well, is there something that I could do for you? He said, no, there's something you could do for yourself. Why don't we sit down and learn a little bit? And we'll go. I'll take you to Svas. We'll go. We'll do. We'll think. It's a beautiful place. So I'm thinking to myself, that'll be interesting. Great story for the Sunday Times. Kid from Queens captured by Hasidim and goes on magical mystery tour. So we went up to Svas and we're walking through the base island, through the cemetery at night. And he says, up there is a very holy place. It's a mikveh. The Ariya Kodesh, a holy person. He lived many years ago. A person goes there, they don't die without doing tshuva, without, without coming back to being a Jew. I'm looking around, I see the cemetery, and he's talking about dying. I'm saying, what's going on here? He said, you know what? I didn't take karate for a year to back down out of this. I went up into that mikveh, and it was a late November night, and it was freezing cold. But I had to do it. After all, here's an elderly fellow going in, and I was only a kid, how could I not? I did, not I came out, and I felt refreshed. Okay, that's great. I did my part. Bye. He says, wait a second. You're not going to stay. Do one mitzvah right. You probably didn't put on tefillin since you bar mitzvah. So said, you're probably right. He said, I'll tell you what. I can get you a very good pair. I'm not in the business, but I'll get a pair for you. It doesn't cost very much. It's a little expensive, but it's worth it. You'll do it here in the land of Israel. Do one mitzvah right. I so I'll think about it. I went back to the Moshav that I was staying on. Now, this was late November, Mar Cheshvan. My birthday, in case you're interested in sending me a card, is in August, Menachem Av. Well, I get this card in the mail on the Moshav that I'm staying at. I look at it, I open it up, and it's from my brother Skip. I love show. And I look at it, and it says, here's a belated birthday card with a belated birthday gift. I'd like you to buy something as though... I bought it for you and something that you'll be able to use. I stared at the check and it was the exact amount of money that the person told me that the tefillin cost. Exactly to the dollar. I took the check, went back to B'nai Brock in Tel Aviv, gave him the check and said, I really enjoyed being with you. Thanks very much. Bye. You'll put on the tefillin? Yeah, for sure, I'll put it on. I went back to Yerushalayim and before you knew it, I found myself meeting some friends. I'm emptying my knapsack. I take out the tefillin and they said, oh, did you all of a sudden become religious? I said, well, not exactly, but I decided to buy these. I said, well, there's a yeshiva right down the block. It happened to be a yeshiva called Or Sameach. I went downstairs. I met some great people, and I felt like I came home. There was a guy who had been to Oxford. There's a guy who studied communications, radio, television, and film. They said, hey, you can find work anytime. How many times are you going to have a chance to take a look at who you are and learn a little bit about your heritage? I said, well, you know, I'm in Israel, right? What am I going to do any more for well, why don't you just take a look? You know what? I never back down from a challenge. And that's what I did. And that brought me along the way, along the path, which is kind of a longer story, and which I call acting Jewish, and perhaps we'll tell that another time, but to bring you up to speed, that's what I was thinking about when those boys told me that they saw a police officer who was walking down Clifton Avenue in Lakewood, 
and he was carrying a talus bag. Now, this fellow was a fine Irishman. He wasn't coming from Dominic Chakras that morning. They knew that for sure. So they said to him, Harry, what do you do with that bag? He said, I just came from a drug bust, and this looked like it kind of belonged to somebody in your community. He said, yeah. We just heard about somebody who just had their twillin stolen. We think we know who it is. He said, tell them to come on down to the station house. So I went down to the station house, and he looks at me, and he says, you know, Mr. Eichler, I have to tell you something. And this is pretty amazing, because this was the eighth day of Kanaka. He looks at me and he says, you know, now he didn't know it was the eighth day of Kanaka, but I did. And he said, this is nothing but a miracle. He says, when I go on a drug bust, I do one thing. That's arrest the perpetrator, and I take the drugs. I don't take stolen merchandise. I don't know what made me think to take this, but I figured maybe it belonged to somebody in your community. And another thing, you know, I always take my squad car back to headquarters. I never walk. This is the first time in eight years on the beat that I decided to walk. Stolen property, and I'm walking instead of driving. Are these yours? I took a look. I said, yes, they are. He said, here, take them back and use them in good health. Hey, this is really providential. Indeed, he was right. So I went back and I called my brother Skip, and I told him the whole story. And he reminded me. He said, parents, don't you remember? He said, when you came back from Eretz Israel, you told me because that reform rabbi didn't want us to put on tefillin, I wasn't putting it on right. You weren't putting it on right. And you told me I'm a lefty. And you went out and you helped me buy a new pair of tefillin. I'll tell you the truth. I wanted to put them on. But I guess I kind of forgot about it. I couldn't even find them. I didn't know where they were. And then just the beginning of this week, all of a sudden, they just kind of appeared in my closet. I started putting them on again, on again and I want you to know that. Well, that was the first day of Kanaka. The last day of Kanaka, mine were found after having been stolen. The first day of Kanaka, my brothers were found and he put them on. And as Rabbi Pesach Krohn once commented when I told him the story, he said, in the merit of one brother helping the other to buy tefillin that brought him on his path, back to return to his people and the other brother helping his to begin to do the, the mitzvah all anew. They returned both in a Shemayim. I guess you could say, I, as my English name is, is Rich, my Hebrew name is Peretz, but I often say, doing the right thing brings rich returns. But that's only if you think outside the locks. Parents B. Eichler, here on Hit a Brute.